Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to Tuesday Teaching Tips, episode 307, and the third class in a series called The Beatitudes and Effective Communication. Lessons for preachers and teachers, thinking about how we might benefit from considering the Beatitudes as a filter through which we consider the way that we preach and teach. What might the impact be on us, us as speakers and our, on our congregations, those who listen to us, if we use the Beatitudes as a way of thinking about how we preach and teach? If these Beatitudes are so significant for the kingdom of God, should they not be particularly significant for us who bring God's word to people? This is the third class, and we're looking at the second Beatitude today, which is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4. Let's get into it straight away. It says, Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And this follows on very naturally, doesn't it, from the first one in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As somebody's pointed out, the first few of the Beatitudes are about emptying in many ways. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be uh, comforted. Let's talk about the meaning of mourning in this sense of what Jesus is talking about here in the context of his teaching, and then we'll talk about how that might apply to us as preachers and teachers. So there were many people in Jesus' day who were mourning, the Pharisees were doing a fair bit of mourning, but what were they mourning about? What was different between their mourning and the mourning that Jesus is talking about? The Pharisees were mourning about the Roman domination. They were mourning maybe over the sins of Israel. But significantly, and we see this in the way that they interact with Jesus, they weren't particularly keen to mourn over their own sin. Now in the Old Testament, which should have been their model at least, spiritually healthy people did mourn over God being dishonored, whether it was people's own sin, perhaps like David in Psalm 51, all the sins of Israel, Psalm 119, verse 136, streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. God did notice and applaud those whose hearts were grieved, like his, like Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. He tells Ezekiel to go through the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are being done in it. We see the same spirit in Paul. Paul had that heart, Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. I've often told you before, now tell you again, even with tears. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Or Acts chapter 20, verse 31, be on your guard, he tells them. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. John Stott said this in his book, Christian Counterculture. He says, Jesus wept over the sins of others, over their bitter consequences in judgment and death, and over the impenitent city that would not receive him. We too, he says, should weep over the evil in the world, as did the godly men of biblical times. So I think what Jesus is talking about here is mourning over the state of the world, but also mourning over our own sin. Think about it. Many of the people lifted up for mention in the Gospels were those who mourned over their own sin. The example of the sinful woman stands out as uh, she cries tears over the feet of Jesus, whilst the Pharisee looks on, tutting at her impious behavior, as he sees it in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. In that situation, the mourner, the crying woman goes home at peace with himself and also with God. So what does this mean for you and me as a preacher and teacher of, of God's word? Well, firstly, I would suggest it means that you and I spend time mourning in private with God. When we mourn over the state of the world, over God's pain for the state of the world, perhaps your own pain at the state of the world, the congregation's pain. Jesus wept and so can we. This isn't to say that we should weep over every sermon preparation and lesson plan, but nonetheless taking some time away to think about how does God feel about the issues that are being brought up in this text that I'm privileged to preach and teach about in the near future. Perhaps we want to mourn over what it would mean for people to ignore this text and its message. What would the consequences be if they did not take seriously what God is bringing to them through us this next time we speak to them? It also means, I think, teaching with soberness. I, I like a laugh, I like a joke, and I do bring humor into, I think, pretty much every lesson, even the more serious ones. I think there's a place for that. The punchlines in the, in the uh, parables in, indicate that there would have been laughter around Jesus. But there's also a need to teach with soberness, and part of that is allowing for lament. Lament has had a bad press in the past, has had a bit more positive uh, an approach to it uh, from some quarters in uh, Christianity and in preaching and teaching recently, but still, it's one of those areas of neglect. Do we allow for lament even in our preaching and teaching? Not everything is easy. Not everything is going to work out just fine. Uh, 
Let me give you this quote from an interesting book called Evoking Lament, a theological discussion by Ava Harasta and Brian Brock I read uh, last year. It says this about lament. And the context is prayer, but I think it fits with what I'm talking about. Any notion of prayer that excludes praise ignores the glory of God and the possibilities for happiness in the world. A notion of prayer that excludes lament disregards the unredeemed state of the world, the judgment of God, and his despair about the world. A triumph of praise over lament obscures God's capacity to suffer and his acts of judgment. A triumph of lament over praise turns lament into embittered blasphemy. So what they're calling for there is a blend and a balance of praise and lament. Equally valuable, none, not the one should dominate the other. They should be both held in tension before God because that's the state of the world we live in and that God understands that. There's something there for us in our preaching. Our preaching should be full of faith and hope and praise of God and, and God should be the focus. But since God also does lament, lament is legitimate and should be there. The pain of the world must be brought into our lessons on some level. So we must recognize the pain and the doubt and the fear, even in our own congregation. Even if it's hidden, it is there, isn't it? Find out what's troubling people at the moment. Don't just look for the good news stories that people may, you may wish people to tell you. But what else is going on that's tough? It doesn't mean that our lesson needs to be full of all the tough stuff and, and neglect the praise and the glory and the hope and the, uh, that God is bringing us. But nonetheless, we've got to acknowledge uh, that, uh, that challenge that is often there in our congregations. Having said that, I would say that even though we must mourn and some lament is appropriate, we should end with hope. The empty tomb is our ultimate, um, our ultimate uh, uh, goal of preaching and teaching because that indicates that there is hope. The cross is not the end. One of the Messiah's jobs was as the comforter who would bind up the brokenhearted in Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 40 verse 1. So therefore, our messages, 99 times out of 100, should end with hope and the anticipation of future healing and joy, even if it's not quite here right now in our present challenges. Well, what do you think about these ideas? Next week, we're going to go on to the third beatitude. But for today, I would like to know what you think about this idea of how we as preachers and teachers inhabit this issue of mourning. It does say those who mourn will be comforted. I don't know about you, but the times I felt most comforted in my life is when I've been through a tough time. A tough time of grieving over something, perhaps a bereavement, a tough time of pain, of struggle, and I come out of it with God and there's a tremendous comfort. But the comfort wouldn't have been as real and powerful if I hadn't been through that time of mourning. In our preaching and teaching, we must reflect that in some way that is healthy and balanced. So, what do you think about this? Please drop me a line, malcolm at malcolmcox.org, or you can leave a message on the uh, on the website or wherever you hear or see this recording. Leave it publicly so that we can learn from each other because we learn best when we're learning in community. If you've got a question about the Bible, drop me a line. If you'd like a free copy of my ebook on spiritual disciplines, then sign up for my newsletter at the website, malcolmcox.org. If you know anybody that might benefit from this, pass the link on, hit that subscribe and notification button so you won't miss anything. And I do hope and pray that between now and the next time you'll experiment and explore this idea of mourning as preachers and teachers before we bring God's message to the people that God has given us to speak to. So, until the next time, keep calm and carry on teaching. Take care and God bless you.